Hi, I'm Irving. You have just entered Cartertopia. In the mid-1970s, some folks decided they wanted to make a TV series out of DC's character Wonder Woman. They shot a made-for-TV movie starring Kathy Lee Crosby that was supposed to be the pilot for a new series. This Wonder Woman wasn't anything like the comics, and basically she's a flag-wrapped super spy. The network didn't care for it and didn't pick up the series. We'll look at that movie after we finish season one, but for now, let's just say there's a reason the network didn't pick it up. Well, when in doubt, revamp. We shifted the story a little bit, cast a better Wonder Woman and Linda Carter, and started over. This one caught on, and we got the series that almost everybody is familiar with. The show went through some weird incarnations. The first season on ABC, it was just called Wonder Woman. The second and third seasons happened on NBC instead, and that show was billed as the new adventures of Wonder Woman. Now, it took Hollywood too many decades to understand that if you call a show a new version of something, you can only call it that for so long before it's not new anymore, and then what do you do? I saw this happen a dozen times when I was growing up and beyond, and they never seemed to get it. Even so, The New Adventures ran for two more seasons, so I guess the show could be new for at least two years. And after that, I suddenly realized I'm putting way too much thought into this. Let's take a look at the pilot. The year is 1942, and we see a fairly typical newsreel about Hitler's march across Europe, Mussolini's rise to power in Italy, and Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. Into this global conflagration steps the Allies' best and greatest hope... Wonder Woman! Wonder Woman! All the world is waiting for you And the power you possess In your satin tights Fighting for your rights And the old red, white, and blue We open in Berlin, where a German pilot is receiving top secret instructions. Hitler. Ja, Herr Hitler. Mab Norris. Speak English, if you don't mind, Herr Kapitän, for secrecy's sake. And the off chance that someone might be listening and learn the secret of your mission. His mission is so secret, up to this point even he didn't know what it was going to be. The plan is for him to take a bomber clear to the American coast and bomb the Brooklyn Naval Yard. In particular, he's looking for one specific building where a newer, better bomb site is being developed and built. Take that out, and not only will it set the Allies' war effort back several years, it will be a huge propaganda victory for Hitler because even the mighty United States isn't beyond his reach. It's a bold plan that could work. Unfortunately, Herr Oberst was correct. Someone was listening. It turns out that Henry Gibson, the coffee guy, is a lot more than he appears to be. The Nazis did use homing pigeons for communication, and this guy quietly retrained a couple of them to carry messages to the Allies. Cool. At the same time that you're bombing the Brooklyn Navy Yard, one of our agents in Washington will be stealing the only duplicate set of plans for the bomb site, thus completely destroying their production capability. Of course, your timing must be flawless. It will be her oberst. I had hoped to undertake this mission myself, but unfortunately, the Fuhrer wishes me to be right here by his side. In Washington, the brass are trying to figure out what to do about this new information. They'll have to send out a pilot of their own to intercept this guy and bring him down. There are lots of qualified fighter pilots who could do it, but Lyle Wagoner is the best looking, so he gets the job. When the general comes in to give him his assignment, he's in the process of um, debriefing his secretary, Marcia. I'm going to have to get him before he reaches the American mainland. Oh, look at the time. Will that be all, Steve? I have a chiropodist appointment this afternoon. Sure, Marcia, go ahead. Thanks. Oh, Marcia. Yes? Uh, see you later tonight. Sure thing. <laughs> Am I the only one who noticed that as quick as it was certain Steve Trevor had the assignment, she had to be somewhere else? I'm sure it's just coincidence. No! Marsha, a spy? My faith in humanity is shattered. If you can't trust a woman you're sleeping with, whom can you trust? 
And I'll bet she's not even really in lust. I mean, love with him either. Try and nail him over the Bermuda area in that so-called Devil's Triangle. Most of us today know it as the Bermuda Triangle, but it's also been known as the Devil's Triangle at various times. What's so special about it again? Since the year 1900, over 50 ships and 60 planes have disappeared in that area without explanation. Oh, right. Good thinking. Well, that might work. At least the Nazis won't know if he's been shot down or taken by the elements. I'm told it could be a gravitational whirlpool that pulls the boats down, but no one's yet had an explanation for the lost planes. It's a strange area, all right. As a matter of fact, there are many uncharted islands in the Triangle. Sort of, uh, tropical paradises. You can save them for after the war, boy. <laughs> the two planes meet each other and begin a fairly typical dogfight. So typical, they made it into stock footage. We get more of that, stock footage with cut-ins of the actors, until the dogfight ends with a game of chicken. Guess who wins? If you guessed nobody, give yourself two brownie points. As the two parachutes carry their loads toward the water, Trevor decides to taunt his opponent a little. Probably shouldn't have done that. The German drops right into a huge school of sharks and they take care of him. Steve Trevor, being one of the two characters in the starring credits, has a better landing. seen that before. Neither have I. Let's find out what it is. Whoa, somebody chart this place quick. He's on Paradise Island, a place populated entirely by women and run by Hippolyta, played by Cloris Leachman. But they're not just any women, for some reason they're immortal. Hippolyta talks about how women were enslaved in Rome and Greece and she swore it would never happen again, so she took her band of women and found this island where they could live in peace and sisterhood. How or why they're immortal is never really explained. But immortality is a handy way to get around the fact that without men to help them reproduce, they would have died out in a single generation. Diana wheedles her way into being Steve's nurse. We get the feeling she's already smitten by him. Well, Lyle Wagner was one of the major hunk heartthrobs of the time. He appeared all over the place, had a spot on Carol Burnett for a while, and even hosted a game show. And here he gets to have Linda Carter mooning over him. Nice work if you can get it. In Washington, Steve is presumed dead. Marsha reports that the pilot failed and Herr Oberst doesn't take it well. How? No one knows. An allied pilot? The devil? Telephones a factory. Tells them to redouble their efforts to complete the XV-13. I will fly it myself. What an unforeseen turn of events. Meanwhile, Hippolyta has told Diana she's not to go near the man anymore. Diana protests. Our civilization is perfection. No. There's something missing, Mother. When I look at Steve Trevor, I feel things. Things I've never known before. I've always wondered what some of these body parts were for, and I think I'm finding out. Hippolytus says the man has to be returned to his own land, both for his safety and for ours. One of our young Amazons will take him back, and will choose which one in the fairest way possible. I have planned a tournament of athletic games, by which I alone shall determine the strongest, nimblest, and most likely aspirant for the assignment. A tournament? That's a wonderful idea, Mother. I look forward to participating in the games myself. You. Never. Diana's not too good at reading subtext, is she? Hippolyta has told her to stay away from Steve, so does she really think her mother would give her any opportunity to be alone with him for an extended period of time? Hippolyta's word is final. Diana will not compete. Then I'd rather not stay for the tournament. Perhaps I'll go on retreat to the Summer Palace. As you wish. 
And if Hippolyta thinks that's really what she's going to do, she's as bad at reading subtext as her daughter is. Contestants in the tournament are masked, so only their demonstrated skill will factor into deciding the winner. The games proceed with a mysterious blonde contestant standing out head and shoulders above the others. I wonder who she could be. It comes down to two finalists, the mystery blonde and one other. The winner will be determined by the final test, bullets and bracelets. For only women have the necessary speed and coordination to attempt bullets and bracelets without the loss of life. And this is where things broke down for a lot of people, including myself. They have an idealized society here. No violence, no ill will toward anyone. We can assume they grow their food and have no enemies, natural or unnatural, and they've been here for over a thousand years. Why do they have guns? And why do the guns look like the typical American revolver of the 1940s? Where did they get them? If they have the technology and resources to make guns, why don't they also make themselves some bicycles so they don't have to walk everywhere? But as most of us know, the technological disconnect is going to get worse. Much, much worse. We'll see just how much next time. Until then, I'm Irving, coming to you from Cartertopia.